I picked up the game Ikaruga in a recent Steam sale, even though it's a game I first played on the Nintendo GameCube many years ago and still have sitting on the shelf behind me. Ikaruga was a game that, well, it actually frustrated me to no end as a child, as I desperately tried to navigate the frantic gameplay and learn the precise mechanics. However, all these years later, I'm noticing that it's a game that really changes the perception of what a shooting game can be. Because of its focus on precision, strategy, and puzzle solving instead of brute force, dodging, and bombing. It requires a different way of thinking from what I'm used to with shooters. And it actually reflects the innovative approach of the company that developed the game, Treasure. Treasure is one of the most revered developers for the Genesis and are known for making action-packed and stylistic games that also bring about a good deal of innovation to classic and traditional genres. They did this for games like Gunstar Heroes, Light Crusader, and Guardian Heroes before Radiant Silvergun, the spiritual predecessor to Ikaruga. Playing through all these games recently, I noticed how visually beautiful and meticulously crafted they are and wanted to talk about this great developer in the two fantastic shooters they created. The Sega Genesis was the proving ground for Treasure, one of the great indie developers of that generation. Treasure is responsible for creating some outstanding original games for this system, and for pushing the limits of action games with over-the-top gameplay mechanics and a healthy dose of the outlandish absurd. Throughout their entire history, they have taken an approach that blends traditional genre conventions with innovative mechanics and imagination that's usually bursting with color and style. Treasure was founded on June 19, 1992, with a staff of just over 10 people, most of whom were ex-Konami employees. The intention from the beginning was to use a small and dynamic team to create original games and not simply churn out sequel after sequel. Creating his own company allowed Treasure founder and president Masato Megawa to create games based on his own vision, and not just as a way to appease shareholders. He was adamant that what people wanted were new, original games, not just sequels and ports of what was already in the arcade. Megawa, when asked about leaving Konami in an interview, said, Basically, Konami is a huge company, so you cannot create games freely. Konami's big titles are TMNT, Castlevania, etc. I just couldn't stand making more sequels. But in order to drive sales, sequels must always be made. When I presented my idea for Gunstar Heroes, they said no, it will not sell. You see, they only want the sure thing because they know it will sell. In the beginning, most of the team at Treasure had their main experience with developing for the Super Nintendo. But Megawa shifted to the Genesis because he believed it was easier to develop for and could display brighter, richer colors. The Motorola 68000 processor could, according to Megawa, give more room for scaling, rotation, and experimentation than what was available on the Super Nintendo. This eventually led to a sort of second-party relationship with Sega, who would go on to publish many Treasure games throughout this generation. The first game Treasure developed was the ambitious Gunstar Heroes, the solidification of Megawa's belief that people wanted new games that took an innovative approach. However, when they pitched the idea of the game to Sega to publish, Sega were put off by the upstart nature of the newly formed developer and were hesitant to put their considerable resources behind them. Sega gave Treasure a deal though, agreed to develop McDonald's Treasureland Adventure, which Sega saw as a way of giving a lower stakes test of the developer's ability, and they would in turn publish Gunstar Heroes. Sega gave Treasure full creative control over Gunstar Heroes as a result of their deal. The only friction came with the name, Sega wanting something a little more conservative than the plans had at first. Originally, the project was named Blade Gunner, a blatant homage to the movie Blade Runner, 
but it was then changed to Lunatic Gunstar. Megawa said of the original title for the game, We felt the word lunatic was a perfect fit to convey the exhilaration of our game, what with all the explosions and detonations. But that didn't go down too well with Sega of America, who thought the word lunatic conveyed a really bad image. Sega came back with the word heroes, believing the connection to justice and honor and all that good stuff would help push the game. So, mashing the two ideas together, Gunstar Heroes was born. And to Sega's credit, they allowed the freshly titled game to be released before McDonald's Treasureland Adventure, even though that game was finished first because of Megawa's insistence that Treasure release their own original idea before any licensed games. According to some sources I found, Sega was all too happy to oblige though when they saw the finished product and the technical innovations that allowed the Genesis hardware to really shine. Gunstar Heroes became a surprise hit for the system, and many see it as one of the icons of the Genesis because of its devotion to wacky action, big colors, quick speed, and its innovative approach to traditional gameplay. Retro Gamer Magazine said of Gunstar Heroes, following all the rules demanded by the genre, it then broke them to create a riotous, gleeful, colorful, cutting-edge slice of brilliance. With its swarms of enemies and elaborate bosses, it pushed the Mega Drive to the limits of its technical capacity. Benjamin Turner of 1UP.com wrote in a review of the game, Given Treasure's devotion to originality, it might seem a little funny that its first game was a side-scrolling run-and-gun in the same general sort as Contra 3. But outside of the most superficial details, nothing about Gunstar Heroes was conventional. In fact, Treasure's debut game was a great encapsulation of what would become the company's key themes. Creativity, weirdness, and a tendency toward almost completely absurd levels of action. I bring up these two specific reviews because I think they go a long way in setting the tone for future Treasure games. Their games are going to be creative, weird, absurdly action-oriented, but also reward the player for learning the game and getting past what could be seen as high levels of difficulty. The weirdness would really show up in Dynamite Heady, Treasure's third game for the Genesis. In Dynamite Heady, you play as a puppet who uses his head to attack and navigate platforms, similar in some ways to the mechanics of Rystar. It plays like a traditional side-scrolling platform game, but the elements that make Treasure stand out as a developer still come through, including an almost chaotic design that can be equal parts exhilarating and exhausting. Dynamite Heady has a lot of... personality, should we say? It's wacky and weird and jams all sorts of variety into the game, and regardless though, it's often spoken of as one of the truly great games on the system, and was met with critical acclaim on its release. Dynamite Heady brings us towards the end of the development cycle for the Genesis, yet Treasure still released three more games before moving on. While working on Dynamite Heady, the team at Treasure was actually split into four groups to work on four separate games, the others being Alien Soldier, Light Crusader, and Yu Yu Hakusho Makyo Toitsusen which was a 2D fighting game that only saw release in Japan and Brazil. The variety of these last three games does show the imaginative approach of Treasure, though, with Alien Soldier being a side-scrolling run-and-gun, similar to Gunstar Heroes, but with a little bit more difficulty, and Light Crusader, which is a puzzle-focused, isometric, dungeon-crawling action-adventure game. That's a lot of adjectives for what is actually a pretty fun game. After these last games to appear on the Genesis, Treasure shifted focus to the next generation. No, not the 3DO and Jaguar, but for our purposes, the Sega Saturn, and notably the expanding power of Sega architecture for the arcade. The first title they released to the Sega Saturn was Guardian Heroes, 
which is important in showing how Treasure were still interested in taking traditional game genres and innovating in interesting new ways. Guardian Heroes is a 2D side-scrolling beat-em-up, but unique sprite work and over-the-top action was combined with things like branching paths and the ability to alter the storyline through player actions, making it a cult classic of the genre. And then, two years later, they finally released Radiant Silver Gun. The beginnings of Radiant Silver Gun go back to the release of Gunstar Heroes. Seeing the final product, Sega loved the frenetic action of the game, and they asked Megawa if Treasure would develop an arcade shooting game for Sega to publish that would appear on their SVT arcade board, and they asked if it could be a shooter. Megawa saw creating a shoot 'em up as a risk, though because he and his team saw 2D action shooting games as a dying breed and a genre that was already oversaturated in arcades. Megawa eventually decided to go ahead with this new project though and enlisted the help of Hiroshi Ayuchi to develop the game. Ayuchi was another ex-Konami employee who loved the genre and had experience developing games for the arcade. In all, the team that developed the game would only number 10 people, tasked with making Ayuchi's lofty vision for the game a reality. The team decided that, if they were to do this right, they would develop the game first and foremost as an arcade game, and only worry about porting it to a console later. The team developing the game did take gameplay cues from some previous games, with Ayuchi specifically naming Image Fight as a source of some inspiration. They also specifically wanted to innovate away from the trend that they called the Toa Plant style shot plus bomb shooters that were common in Japanese arcades. The first way the team did this was through the attacks in the game. The team did not program any items or power-ups into Radiant Silver Gun wanting it to instead focus on the moving and dodging mechanics that they meticulously programmed. Ayuchi said, The reason I didn't include items in Radiant Silver Gun is simply that when I play shooting games, they are a very frequent and stupid cause of my death. For example, in Gradius, when you want to select Option, but you accidentally take one power up too many and select Shield. Or in Thunder Force, when you want to select Homing, but you press the button too many times and end up dying as you try to cycle back to it. That's why, this time, I wanted to confront that problem head on and create a game that progresses simply through shooting and dodging. The kinesthetic feeling of the game was a big consideration, and Ayuchi made sure to extend this to the button combinations. Radiant Silver Gun, at least in its arcade form, has a unique three button layout where certain button combinations lead to different attacks. Press the A button for a forward blast, B for a homing attack, and C for a sideways bomb. Pressing these in combination will trigger other attacks like a backwards blast or a lock-on attack. This was a deliberate design choice intended to tie attacks to finger dexterity and memory rather than having to switch between weapons and power-ups. On the Saturn, this was expanded to use the 6-button controller plus the R button. The game has bright colors and detailed polygonal enemies, but the slower overall speed of the game allowed it to run on the STV arcade board, which was close in architecture to the Sega Saturn but with additional RAM. The slower speed of the game though wasn't just to save on some bandwidth. With Ayuchi saying they deliberately made the bullets and gameplay slow so that more players can enjoy the pleasure of bullet dodging. As the game was reaching the final stages of development though, the team ran into a problem. It was too difficult. 
Megawa said that the game came together pretty easily and did not run into any major development problems, except when it entered what he called the debug phase. The game was simply too hard for most people to be able to complete. Because of this, Treasure invited a group of professional gamers who achieved high scores in other popular shooters to help playtest and refine the difficulty. Apparently only one person was able to actually play through the entire game before the playtesting. The status as a very hard game was used in the marketing of the game, and Megawa was worried though that it would scare too many people away. So much so that he personally visited arcades on the day the game was released to gauge opinions and hear feedback, which thankfully came out very positively. From this point on, I'll mainly be talking about the Sega Saturn version of the game, but the gameplay footage you see actually comes from the Xbox Live arcade version of Radiant Silvergun. For the Sega Saturn version, one of the major changes was adding a full story to the beginning of the game. One thing that really smacks you on the nose about these is the outlandish style of the cutscenes that begin the game and are interspersed throughout. However, the story and cutscenes actually point towards the ambition of the game as being more than just a simple shooter, and Treasure hired the animation studio Gonzo to create these cutscenes. The story is a sort of Tarantino-esque, non-linear saga that bounces around from the middle of the story to the beginning and then again to the end. The story was added exclusively for the Saturn release too, and in the arcade, you'll be dropped into a stage without any real context as to what's happening. For a short synopsis though, the almost comical opening scene quickly takes on a different tenor as the apocalyptic nature of the story begins to unfold. The story is about the discovery of an ancient crystal artifact that, when activated, destroys all life on Earth, except for the crew of an orbiting spaceship called Tetra. Seeing the destruction that the godlike artifact is causing, Tetra enters the Earth's atmosphere and attempts to do its part to protect whatever remains of humanity. As the game and the story progresses though, some mystery develops, as buried with this stone artifact is a man-made robot. A robot that happens to share the exact same serial number as the robot member of the crew named Creator. I'll cut right to it and say that, yes, Radiant Silvergun can be a devastatingly difficult game. Most reviews of the era said so too, with Edge Magazine calling it one of the most gut-wrenchingly tough shoot-'em-ups ever made. It doesn't even really give you that much space to learn, as right from the start of the game, the difficulty is on display. The difficulty is a result of deliberate design choices that make the game lean more towards being a puzzle game, which seems odd being that it's a shooter, but the puzzle elements present themselves in the slow and methodical scrolling of the game, varied enemy types, and requirement of using multiple weapons. The puzzle element is most evident in the scoring. Enemies are one of three different colors, red, blue, or yellow, and destroying enemies of the same color in a row multiplies the score exponentially. So, if you simply want to beat through the game, there is the memorization of levels and bosses. But if you want to get a higher score, you must focus instead on building the score multiplier by killing more of the same color. Another puzzle-like element of the game is the requirement for really precise control and pinpoint accuracy. Radiant Silvergun does have elements of a bullet hell and a very precise movement through environmental obstacles and blockades, well, usually getting shot at of course, is a main requirement. The tight movement requires a high level of skill, and there are tons of environmental obstacles that block progress and push you through tiny bottlenecks. Seeing some of these obstacles the first time, they can seem impossible, which is why learning the different weapons and progressing through the game slowly are a main point. 
There are a total of seven weapons in the game, and in keeping with Ayuchi's original vision, all seven weapons are available right from the start. Each has a specific purpose or function that creates a pro and con for using each. For example, the main Gatling cannon fires a blast in front of the ship, but in the sections where you must move through barriers and obstacles, it's pretty much useless. On the other side, though, is the homing attack, which is great for when you dodge swarms of bullets or navigate through small gaps, but it's also very weak hitting and does little to the health bar of bigger ships and stage bosses. The weapons actually have a similar feel in some ways to Gunstar Heroes in the way they interact with enemies and fill the screen with color. One of the most important weapons in the game is the Radiant Sword, and I think it hints towards what would later come in Ikaruga. The Radiant Sword was activated in the arcade by pressing all three attack buttons simultaneously, which gives it a break glass sort of feeling, though it was mapped to the much more manageable R button on the Saturn release. When activated, the Radiant Sword moves in a circle around your ship, and if the buttons are held, it rounds your ship to the opposite direction of where you're moving. The Radiant Sword is important because it's used to absorb the slow-moving purple bullets that certain enemies fire. Once you gather enough of these bullets, a different amount across the difficulties, you can unleash two massive blades that eviscerate everything in front of your ship and render you invincible in the process. The Radiant Blade is one of the main mechanics you'll use in boss fights, as bosses usually run off a lot of these slow-moving purple bullets. The bosses really are a standout part of the game, too. The polygonal bosses of Radiant Silver Gun are massive, hulking beasts that require quick movement and precise shooting. The patterns they utilize are some of the best I've seen in shooters, and really showcase the imagination of the team of treasure. Like had become somewhat standard at this point, each boss is made of multiple parts that must be destroyed individually, and each part is responsible for a different attack. The bosses are where the weapon selection is important, as bosses move around the screen, forcing different attack patterns and angles. I really can't overstate the variation that the bosses have though, and while there are a few that feel a bit samey, the majority are gorgeous to look at and force you to think and strategize as you dart around the screen. One boss in particular that gets a lot of attention is towards the end of the game. Radiant Silvergun has a quick introduction to each boss and calls this one Ziga, and he's a kind of silhouette Ultraman looking thing. The boss is really unlike anything else though, and he moves around the screen, attacking from different directions and with different patterns, and at times is positioned in a way to make it appear like he's chasing after your ship. It's a really brilliant piece of presentation, and it's made even better with a subdued musical piece that has a focusing effect. I find that Radiant Silver Gun is a game that's all about feeling. Looking at the game with modern eyes and modern definitions, Radiant Silver Gun achieves, dare I say it, an almost Souls-like gameplay loop, where dying is just a part of it, but so is the push to keep moving forward and getting a little bit further each time. Radiant Silver Gun is a perfect example of a game that rewards the player for learning how to play the game. And as you learn how to play the game, you get a little bit farther and a little bit better. In this way, it changes the perception of a shooting game from something that can just be blasted through to something you must pay attention to and really take in. Even with the high level of difficulty, Radiant Silver Gun received high praise and it's seen as a classic of the genre. Reviews at the time and retrospective reviews that have come out over the years all hold it in extremely high regard, saying it's one of the true classics of the genre. Radiant Silver Gun is also seen as one of the reasons for an increase in video game importing, and maybe one of the titles that turned importing more mainstream. 
Because of the legendary status it was able to cultivate, more and more North American gamers found ways to get physical copies across the Pacific. This, along with more websites and magazines dedicated to import review sections, led to Radiant Silvergun being at least slightly more common in America than it should have been otherwise. The relative success of Radiant Silvergun, and the desire to tell more of the story, lets us continue full circle to the game I originally wanted to talk about, Ikaruga. It would have been downright neglectful of me to not first look at Radiant Silvergun before Ikaruga because of the similarities these two games share. Ayuchi always saw these two games as being related, but because of the differences in world and gameplay, maybe we can think of them more like cousins than close brothers. Ayuchi did have this to say though about the connection between Radiant Silvergun and Ikaruga. He said, if you want to call Ikaruga a sequel to Radiant Silver Gun, then you can call it a sequel. But it's a little different than your Part 2 or Part 3 direct sequel. In reality, it's an entirely different game. Conceptually, it is tied to Radiant Silver Gun, and both games share certain basic aspects. Ikaruga is connected with the ideas we had for the second game, specifically our ideas about the setting. Ayuchi went on to say that the original intention was for Radiant Silvergun to be part of a trilogy, with Ikaruga being the second installment that expanded on the thematic meaning of the first game, if not directly on the story. The third game in the trilogy would never materialize though, as Ayuchi believes Ikaruga changed the original meaning and themes he wanted to get across. Hiroshi Ayuchi was again the director for Ikaruga, and began working with his team to develop the game from home, when not working on his official project at the time, Sin and Punishment. Ayuchi himself was not a programmer, so to make Ikaruga he ended up reusing sprites from Radiant Silver Gun, some that were simply recolored or expanded directly from that game, and some that originally made their way to the cutting room floor. Programmer Atsutomo Nakagawa did a lot of work in creating the look of the game, taking the sprites that Ayuchi provided and creating the backgrounds and stages. Ayuchi said, The Ikaruga prototype was something I made on the computer as part of the initial pitch to Treasure. I tend to prefer very stiff, rigid gameplay systems, but our programmer Atsutomo Nakagawa thought it would be better if the game could be played in a more rough, casual style. We revised quite a few things to get it into its present shape. All in all, Ikaruga was created with a staff of five developers from Treasure, along with three additional support staff from GREV, and it would be self-funded and later self-published. Megawa referred to the game as a low-budget game, with the intention of being a game that brought the designer's vision to life, but without the need to make millions in sales. Regardless, it is amazing to see the final product when, all throughout development, it was seen as a passion project and not a major release. The unique characteristic of Ikaruga is the two-color polarity system that allows a color shift to absorb enemy attacks or chain combos for higher score. Aichi developed this system from a few different influences and from a desire to simplify what he thought were potential flaws with Radiant Silver Gun. In creating Ikaruga, Hiroshi Ayuchi took inspiration from this game that I'm not going to try to pronounce, which was a game he worked on previously for another company, and from another treasure game, Silhouette Mirage, released to the Sega Saturn. Originally, the polarity system in Ikaruga was used to absorb enemy attacks, which would then form the ammo supply for your own ship. However, this was eventually abandoned as Ayuchi thought it slowed the game down too much and it required a constant supervision of an ammo supply. 
Along with the new polarity system that simplified attacking in Ikaruga, major changes to scoring and chaining allowed a more casual playstyle, meaning Ikaruga can be seen as a doubling down of the gameplay concepts of Radiant Silver Gun and a shift to an almost completely puzzle or strategy type shooter. Enemies within each level were actually intentionally mixed up as well, so that finding a perfect run would be very difficult. The polarity system is in a lot of ways a reflection of the story theme of the game, and ties to the Buddhist idea of yin and yang, or opposite and negative, light and dark, etc. This theme is made a little clearer when looking up the real Ikaruga, a city in the Nara prefecture of Japan that is home to two ancient Buddhist temples. Furthermore, each of the five stages carries a name that has a special meaning in Buddhism. Ayuchi always talked about Ikaruga having a special meaning to him and a meaning that he thought was bigger than the game itself. Maybe some of these Buddhist themes and motifs that show up in the graphical design of the game point to what he was talking about. The story of Ikaruga is much simpler than Radiant Silver Gun and really only forms the background of the game. Without the complex anime cutscenes of Radiant Silver Gun, Ikaruga feels a bit more like a traditional and older shooter with a story created simply to act as a narrative framing for the action of the game. According to the GameCube manual, the story of Ikaruga involves the classic shooter archetype of a single pilot fighting back against an all-powerful enemy. The enemy in question here is named Tenro Horai, who uncovers a power called the Power of the Gods, which he uses to lead a group of followers, known as the Divine Ones, to begin conquering neighboring nations one by one. A second federation of unconquered people called Tenkaku emerges to challenge Horai, but they are defeated in a climactic battle, leaving Shinra the only surviving pilot. Shinra refuses to accept defeat and attempts to wage another attack, but is shot down and has his fighter destroyed. Luckily for Shinra though, he happens to crash land in the remote village called Ikaruga, whose inhabitants nurse him back to life and entrust him with the village fighter plane, also called Ikaruga. Much like I said with Radiant Silver Gun, simply calling Ikaruga difficult would be a massive understatement. Ikaruga is a brutal beast of a game that pulls no punches and requires pinpoint accuracy and speed to a level that I'm not even sure Radiant Silver Gun achieves. The gameplay itself does echo the dire scenario alluded to in the story, overwhelming the player with impossible geometry across its five stages. If I had one word to sum up Ikaruga, it's precision, and I hope that the gameplay shows how precise movement and focus are the main skills the game requires. The difficulty of Ikaruga does come as a result of the black and white polarity system, and the developers intended this to be the main area of difficulty rather than reflexive bullet dodging. The need to constantly moderate between the black and white polarity intensifies the puzzle-like gameplay mechanic of the game. Mesato Megawa, when talking about Ikaruga, said, Because Ikaruga is a type of game that hasn't been seen before, many people called it difficult. With games that you can clear by reflexes alone, everything turns on how well the pacing and difficulty are balanced. But with a game like Ikaruga, that requires thinking and strategy to clear, if we make it too easy, then it defeats the whole purpose of it being a fun puzzle to solve. To defend yourself in Ikaruga, you have a pretty standard forward attack that changes color based on which polarity you're acting under. On top of this though, you have a homing laser that charges up when absorbing the same color bullets and laser attacks from enemies. The forward attack is a precise forward blast that kills most enemies quickly, but has the added benefit of being used to rack up the score multiplier with accurate fire, should you choose to focus on score. The homing laser is the approximation of what could be a bomb in other shooters, and as it charges up, it unleashes more powerful homing lasers that destroy more enemies or cause more damage to bosses. 
the weapons in the game feel simple and unobtrusive and mean that you can focus on the other parts of the game and unlocking the giant puzzle that the game presents. Like many of the systems in Ikaruga, they feel like a simplification or intensification of what Ayuchi tried to achieve in Radiant Silver Gun. In that game, managing your weapons by using different button combinations was the main way to attack and defend in the game. However, in Ikaruga, the main form of dexterity comes in switching between the two polarities. No longer do you have to worry about which weapon works for which part of the game, but instead have to be aware of which color the enemies are attacking with. Sometimes these changes require near-perfect timing, too, and it's not uncommon to be backed into a tiny spot on the screen, with the only option being to switch polarities in an exact moment to keep up the pressure. The brilliant thing about the polarity system is that deaths are completely the player's fault now. Which, of course, an obvious answer is, well, of course they are, but there is a deeper level of player control over this than in other games. This is because if you match the polarity of the enemy that's attacking, you don't receive any damage. So, if you're able to constantly match and moderate the polarity of your ship with enemy attacks, you're invincible. So not keeping up with the patterns of attack, or not recognizing the patterns fast enough, is where deaths come from. So in playing the game, I always felt that I could avoid deaths if I practiced and focused and memorized the shape of the stage a little bit better. Like in Radiant Silver Gun before it, the ship in Ikaruga does not have any speed settings, and it's overall not very fast either. And kind of lumbers around the screen like the Vic Viper without any power-ups. Again though, this was an intentional part of the game and allows you to achieve a bit more precise movement. What I found in playing is that the goal of the ship in Ikaruga isn't as much to dodge attacks but instead position the ship in such a way to avoid attacks altogether and simultaneously absorb as much energy as possible to fire the homing laser. This again goes back to the original intention with the game too of making it slower and more cautious than other shooters. The bosses in Ikaruga are really awesome. They may not be quite as stylistic as Radiant Silver Gun, but instead rely on intricate patterns of interlacing attacks that absolutely test your stamina and resilience. The bosses are where the puzzle element of the game really takes full shape but they also require a lot of dexterity and even more focus. A few of the bosses just really boggle my mind, and I could only figure out how to beat them after multiple playthroughs of testing strategy and getting better at shifting the polarity of my ship. This boss in stage four, for example, fills the screen with lasers and looks nearly impossible to beat the first few times. It is a doubling down of a boss in a previous stage too that has similar patterns, but is a little more forgiving. All of the bosses have a time limit, and failing to beat the boss within the time will see you lose out on a big chunk of bonus points. The final stage of the game has a boss that takes three different forms, each one a bit more intense than the last. After this boss is defeated, the final form comes in its own stage and it turns the gameplay on its head. You can't attack this boss and are forced to instead dodge attacks and absorb as much energy as possible that releases in a final suicidal mirage that destroys everything on the screen. After this, the credits roll to a somber final image and Ikaruga has been vanquished. I should note, too, that the shape of the final boss in Ikaruga mirrors that of Radiant Silver Gun. Maybe some more subtle hints here that these two games share something in common, if even just at a level of metaphor.
When I was younger, I'll admit again that I was never able to beat through Ikaruga and moved on to games that didn't require as much of a test of patience. But as a grown-ass adult now, I will say that Ikaruga is beatable with a lot of practice. And if you choose to play on Steam, you'll have the added benefit of allowing more continues in the arcade mode to practice the stages. One major reason I say the game is beatable, though, is the short overall length. It's only five stages, and a single playthrough, start to end, can be achieved in just around 30 minutes. You'll have a lot of fun in this short playthrough, though, because the music in the game is, as in any great shooter, phenomenal. It's a kind of rock techno hybrid with some classical influences too. I find that it just really matches well with the gameplay and the visual presentation of the game is also really great. The visuals have a complex labyrinthian style and are really incredible to look at at times. Though being that it is so focused on the two color system, there is a rather limited color palette of red, blue, white, and black. I will say too though that I did find Ikaruga caused me quite a bit of dizziness because of the sheer amount of lights and flickering on the screen. When I play a bullet hell type game I sometimes only focus my eyes on the ship and it helps me navigate the tiny spaces between bullets and in Ikaruga this just sent my brain off to another planet a few times. One of the most memed parts of the game are the cryptic and wonderfully ham-fisted translations of story blurbs that quickly pop onto the screen at the start of each stage and before each boss. This is actually a tradition of treasure games that was in Gunstar Heroes and Radiant Silver Gun too. In Ikaruga we have Warning. The big enemy is approaching at full throttle. According to the data, it is identified as Butsu Tekai, No Refuge. Compare this to the boss Ziga in Radiant Silver Gun that we looked at earlier, which reads, Be attitude for gains. One, be praying. Two, be praying. Three, be praying. Like Radiant Silver Gun before it, Ikaruga achieved a high level of critical acclaim in the North American GameCube release. Nintendo Life said there's really nothing more to say, except that if you're a shooter fan, you absolutely must own at least one version of this masterpiece. IGN echoed this, saying that it's a fantastic example of clever game design, while also claiming it to be a better game than Radiant Silver Gun because it takes itself a little bit more seriously. Across most reviews, the visual presentation, pixel-perfect gameplay tuning, and feel of the game were praised, while the difficulty and shortness of the game did bring up some negativity. It's hard to say which of the two big treasure shooters have more of a lasting impact, which is why I think they both have to be kind of lumped together. Both are frequently talked about as being among the best of the genre, if not among the best of any genre. The meticulous level of detail and necessity of mastering your skills to progress presents a challenge in both games that really gets under your skin and makes it hard to put them down. Radiant Silver Gun, though, does feel a bit more like a quest, and the longer overall length and story elements make it a more familiar experience to play. I really love the weapons in Radiant Silver Gun, too, and the way that weapons must be used in a puzzle-like manner in conjunction with the stage design. I must admit, too, that I kind of like the campy, melodramatic gameness of it. It feels more retro because of it, maybe? Like it's a bit more self-aware and tries to big up the fun factor because of it. This is actually something that I find across a lot of the earlier treasure games, but something that's lost a little bit in Ikaruga. However, the frantic pace of Ikaruga blasts you right in the face from the opening level, and the fastidious nature of the gameplay because of the polarity system and intricate patterns makes it such an amazing game to look at in practice. It's a far more stripped back game, and it feels like it just has the bare necessities to allow the gameplay to shine through. I will say too though that I found myself more genuinely frustrated at Nicaruga because some of the encounters seem near impossible, 
While Radiant Silvergun always gave me a bit more of a feeling that I could overcome the major obstacles of the game. Regardless of these ramblings, though, both games are, indeed, colossuses of gaming that value developer vision and gameplay over all else. They're not games simply made to sell copies, but they're gamers' games, and two games that stand out as love letters to an age and genre that needed all the innovation it could get, and got the innovation it deserved.